once again, welcome everybody to another series of um, our Hangout sessions. Um, I'm here today with Brian Doyle from TEDx Foggy Bottom. I appreciate that everyone can hear me now. And I can tell by Ian's face, this is very hilarious. Um, and Brian is uh, from TEDx Foggy Bottom from Washington, D.C. in the U.S. And um, he's going to be talking about succession planning and sort of how to start thinking about it early enough tools, best practices, etc. Um, so before I kick it over to him, I wanted to go through some some hangout etiquette, which is to mute yourself uh, when you're not speaking and to sort of be courteous um, when people are asking questions, uh, make sure that you are sort of raising your hand um, so that I can you know, throw you into an order and Brian can answer your questions. He's going to go through his presentation and then he'll take questions. So if you, if you think of something and you want to drop it into the chat, um, I'll hang on to those and make sure that all of the questions um, get asked again uh, when Brian is finished with his presentation to make sure that everyone's questions are answered. Um, and so he is going to lead from here. So over to you, Brian. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and hello and welcome to anybody watching now or watching later. Um, I really hope this is a tool for people, whether it's uh, college students like myself um, or people who are um, in their later years organizing any of these types of events to use and to um, use as a resource. So um, the first thing I want to talk about actually is sort of who I am and TEDx Foggy Bottom is um, to give you guys some context. And so basically, um, for me personally, um, I got involved with the TEDx program when I was in high school in 2011. Um, and uh, got to college uh, at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., um, and started this event called TEDx Foggy Bottom. Um, Foggy Bottom has to do with our neighborhood. Um, and uh, when I started in 2012, uh, it was just myself, um, and we had a very, very small budget, small uh, team. In fact, um, we had a few volunteers, but um, it was very, very small. We had four speakers. Um, following that, I attended TED Global uh, 2012 in Scotland, um, and then just moving forward, 2013, we had myself and another person helping. Uh, 2014, we actually built uh, into a team of about 30 people, and uh, we had a five-person executive board. And then in 2015, it's just the event we just had in April, um, we had a 42-person team um, and a seven-person executive board, um, including myself as the one curator, uh, which I'll get to later. And so over the years, TEDx Foggy Bottom has um, grown in many ways. Um, we are technically a standard event as opposed to a university event. Um, and uh, we've built, uh, we've had uh, over 50 speakers now in the past four years. And we've had, I think our videos are approaching about 1 million views online. And so we're very proud um, to see where it's gone. Um, now with that though, um, comes the uh, idea of transitioning onward, um, whether that's me as the founder or whether that's anyone in the future who takes over my role. And so um, the first thing I actually want to make sure I get across about that process is um, how important it is to be honest um, with yourself as um, a leading member of uh, your TEDx event um, about the need uh, to plan for secession, um, uh, just because um, it's a process that should be started very early on. Um, and I think a lot of times it can be tough to admit to uh, to yourself or for the leader of the group to admit to him or to his or herself that it's time to uh, sort of plan for the uh, you know leaving um, and to sort of let go of the reins a bit, um, which I know personally was very tough, um, just because out of out of pride and out of um, sadness, because you know you want to keep working on it. But I think it's very important, and um, hopefully you have a team that's willing to help you. And so um, that sort of leads into the idea of the timeline and certain variables uh, uh, regarding that. And so. Um, for TEDx Foggy Bottom, we started the process about a year and a half ago. Um, and so uh, when I was in my third year of college, um, again, I just graduated about three weeks ago from the George Washington University. And so when I was in my third year of college um, uh, was when I started planning for this and started discussing it with our uh, small executive board at the time, um, knowing that the next year would be the true bulk of taking that um, process and putting it into full effect. And so. Um, with that, though, comes, and I'll get more into absolutely the sort of what we did, obviously, uh, for transitioning in a second. But um, in regard to different variables, uh, just because my TEDx event might differ from anyone who's watching this, um, the, the difference in event structure is important. So whether you're a standard event, whether it's a university event, um, and even with that, uh, you know, who's organizing it? Um, you know, are you 
a group of um, adults that have full-time jobs that just uh, volunteer your time sometimes on the weekends to put this together. Um, in my case, um, we are a group of about 42 students that are full-time undergraduate students um, committed to a lot of different things that volunteer all the time um, for the event. And so that's very important um, to begin with, first of all, just because um, you need to think about, okay, you know, given the resources that we have and given how we are structured as an event, how can, how should we start this process? Should it be sooner? Should it be later? Um, who should we talk to? And then with that is who is your support, um, both financially and, you know, uh, manual labor uh, uh, with, um, us, it's uh, a university-based port, even though we aren't um, uh, necessarily a university event. So we aren't TEDxGW, um, but that being said, a lot of our financial support comes from the university as well as different partners. Um, and as I said before, our actual team support comes from uh, undergraduate students. And uh, with that, maybe you're another event uh, that, is, um, that is planned by adults and um, has uh, financial support from the different companies that the adults work with. Um, or, uh, for example, a TEDx youth event um, might be organized by a bunch of high school students, um, like I was a part of about four years ago, but the bulk um, organizing and financial support might be by a few different adults that can very quickly get burned out um, or um, you know, just don't have time for it anymore. And so looking at that, keeping that in mind is important with the context, just because the way that we transitioned is not necessarily a, you know, a boilerplate template for how other people can transition. It's important to sort of meld it into the way that your team and that your um, event is really looking at. Um, and uh, I think as well, another variable is the idea of what do you want your event to accomplish? Um, you know, what, what even is the purpose of your event? Um, I think there needs to be that sort of backbone of um, passion, but more so um, uh, actual dedication, um, which sort of leads me into about Two years ago, our event at TEDx Foggy Bottom created a constitution, if you will, um, for our event, um, where we basically sat down and have continued developing it, but have thought much about, um, you know, who we are as an event, um, you know, what we're trying to do, and I think most importantly is uh, why do we exist, um, and that actually came into play very strongly this past year to talk about our theme, um, but that idea of why are we even here as an event, I think, is important just because. For one, I think it's important so that your team in the current moment can really, um, you know, have a platform to go off of and decide what you want your event to look like and to really energize yourselves around. But also for the future, I think it's important because, um, you know, depending on if you're going to be an event that lasts five years or 10 or 15, um, future leadership um, can look back and uh, sort of see what, um, you know, the original members and what members beyond that have sort of thought about where the event should go, um, but as well as with change. You know, I think the biggest step for me personally um, having to transition is um, I, I'm hopefully the first and only person that has to transition after like multiple years of leadership um, in the sense that now that our event is sort of up and running um, after four years, you know, every year there could be um, and probably will be somebody new in leadership and so having that constitution is important um, but i do think that ability to recognize that um, uh, as the person sort of transitioning out or as the people transitioning out that the event will most likely and inevitably look different than the way that you had thought i think that's a really important step to sort of not only accept but also embrace um, you know for me um, I'm very excited to see what uh, the new leadership does, and I think that there will absolutely be things that um, weren't necessarily in my head that should have happened or, or should not have happened, and yet I think that's important. I think that's the way an organization will grow, and I think that's the way that TEDx Foggy Bottom will hopefully continue to be successful. And so with that um, sort of comes my dis uh, discussion of the 2015 structure that we have moving forward as of an event um, and how we uh, sort of began and or facilitated our transition process. And so about a year and a half ago when we, just, when we started talking about this, um, we knew that um, to be successful in a environment with college students organizing this event and also just realistically with workload, that we were gonna split my job into two. And so we were going to have two co-curators. Um, and so uh, ideally, um, you know, one would, be, um, one would be a man, one would be a woman, um, one, um, the cohesiveness between the two was important, 
um, which I'll get to later as well. Um, and uh, and so with those two co-curators, um, another aspect that was very hugely important to this process is the licensee issue um, in the sense that uh, since I had attended TED Global, um, I had the ability to um, organize events over 100 people. Um, and so um, if you're a TEDx organizer, you know that in order to do that, you need to attend one of these conferences. And so for us, it was very crucial to get somebody else um, in the driver's seat, if you will, to attend one of those conferences. And so that can be TED Global. Um, for in my case, this past year, uh, with our, or sorry, with our new uh, co-curators, it was TED Active. We sent one of them. Um, or any of the, um, the newer you know, TED Global meetups um, that are happening in Europe, um, which we can get to later as well. But, um, so there's many options for that. But um, that was really big for us just because we had to plan that into our budget, um, which we did. We ended up having um, a certain amount of money set aside to help that person pay for the conference, um, whichever one of the two it was going to be. Um, and uh, in our case, just specifically, um, we had a, the incoming co-curators. Um, their names are Eli and Lauren. And um, uh, Eli is a junior or will be a junior, a third year, and Lauren will be a senior. And so it made the most sense to send um, Eli uh, for longevity purposes because um, just in case we don't have the budget the following year, we have Eli um, with that sort of licensing ability uh, for at least two years. And so um, that was important for us to plan. And I think that that is, that is definitely something that I think most people overlook sometimes. Um, people outside of the TEDx community have sometimes have no clue that you need to attend one of these um, conferences to you know, organize an event that's over 100 people. And, um, and so I think it's um, important to really think about that early um, and transferring the license just because, um, you know, if you don't think about it till the very end and then I leave or whoever, again, in your case, has the license, that can be a little bit stressful. Um, uh, moving forward, we, uh, we created an application process. And so we had um, the members uh, of our team apply. Um, to be part of this co-curating um, experience. And um, with that, we, uh, we asked, um, we, we tried to look at um, that both co-curators would uh, not, neither of them would be studying abroad um, during the time of their, um, their tenure, if you will, if you will at, as co-curator. And even with that, that sort of narrows the applicant pool, which is important to think about um, because these rules might need to change depending on what actual resources you have. We are fortunate to have you know, 42 person team with about 10 to 15 people that were, um, you know, uh, able to be the co-curator. But if you only have one or two, um, you know, that can be tough, but um, it's important to think about. And so we had that as a rule. Um, again, the licensing issue is important. Um, we asked that one of the co-curators, or sorry, both of them um, had served uh, a prior um, position on the executive board. Um, for us as a team, um, we, like I said earlier, we have a seven person executive board this year and then about a 30, 35 person, uh, team. And, um, we all are very equal in terms of, um, how we see each other. But, um, out of the honesty side, uh, we, there's a, t a lot more workload into an executive board position as I'm sure anyone organizing a TEDx event knows. And so that's important for us to have the co-curators having served in that position, um, because it would be a very large jump to go from. Um, sort of a general body team member to a co-curator position. Um, and um, like I said earlier, we ideally want them both to not be uh, seniors. Um, one can be, but ideally not both um, uh, because a, a few things. One, um, just be, with both being seniors, you do run the risk of um, sort of burnout and getting kind of tired of something, of it, of, of senior year in general by the end of the year. And if both co-curators are in that position of, I don't really have the passion for this anymore, especially following the event when the transition process then is most important. That's a big issue. And so we like to have, um, you know, somebody uh, in a younger seat as well um, so that hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, and even then, um, I will say that I'm very proud of our team and we, um, we have an amazing team that would hopefully never get to that level of burnout because we like to delegate work uh, equally. But um, um, and then the other thing, uh, the other uh, aspects of the application is that um, we do, you know, in sort of a, almost as like if it was a job, um, we do make it clear that, you know, a commitment to the organization itself should be pretty top priority um, around, you know, of course, second to things like academics and personal health. 
Um, but you know, at least on our campus and in our community, um, being a part of our organization is a full-time commitment. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, some of our executive board members racked up over a thousand, um, you know, hours each on this, um, each year. And I'm sure in, in many of your shoes, whether you're a team member, uh, a curator, an organizer, a, co a content director, um, you're finding that, yes, it takes a lot of time. And so we like to make that clear uh, from the get-go because we just want people to be very understanding of how much work actually goes into these things. Um, and I know that the TEDx community knows that well. Um, and um, and we also make it clear that you can only serve um, as a uh, co-curator once um, just because we think it's important that um, you, know, you don't have reigning leadership, um, if you will. I mean, in my case, the one tough thing is that, uh, you know, the first two years out of the four, it was basically just myself struggling to find people. And so um, if I was actually here for another few years, I would be stepping down, of course, but I would still be part of the team, which I think is important that um, we have incredible people on our team, and I hope you do too, who, you know, are stepping into that role. But then the following year, if they're still obviously an undergrad, would love to be a part of it um, and whatnot. And so, um, and then also another important and last thing with that application was um, that your position doesn't necessarily end the day the event ends. Um, it ends following the next year's co-curators and it ends when that transition is fully in effect. Um, and so um, that all being said, um, the transition process, like I said, um, has taken a little over a year. And so that is things like transferring documents, transferring information, um, things that I know. And some ways that we are doing that um, sort of are the following. Um, I personally, uh, over the past um, month or so, have been working on um, sort of a manifesto document, if you will, which is basically my way of putting everything and anything that I have on my brain um, into a document so that um, the organizers next year can look at that and um, see if that helps at all. Um, I would also make a side note here that um, this is a little bit more important in my mind just because I'm, I'm actually traveling for the next year. And so I'm, there's, there's potential for me not to even be available versus if I was still in the city or if I was still around, then um, that document might not be as of much importance. Um, but anyways, um, I also for the past three months have been meeting uh, weekly with our new co-curators to actually sit down and get face-to-face -face, um, transitioning time. And so each week we've sort of picked a topic, whether it was speakers um, or how to uh, you know, work with partners um, or uh, logistics with our, uh, our theater venue um, or our exhibit space um, or even just getting the email addresses of important speaker contacts or um, financial resources. Um, we sort of choose a topic and then each week we sort of go into depth and they ask me questions um, about that and I gave them as much information as possible with obviously the knowledge in mind that um, this is very much a learn by doing experience which is what we love and so as much as I can help <clears throat> um, it will take next year for them to just really dive into it um, to get in. And so um, uh, another thing that we did throughout the year was something that I dubbed Coffee with a Curator, um, which was sort of a, a cute way for team members and anyone really who wanted to meet with me um, as the curator um, to just ask me questions, hear stories. Um, and that was, um, you know, I, I will admit that, and anyone on my team will also admit that I, I like to, uh, explain myself and talk a lot, um, not out of love for hearing my own voice, but just because I love the TEDx program so much. And so um, that being said, these Coffee with the Curator sessions were a beautiful way for me to separate work from story time. Um, and so people could come and they could hear my stories at a later date um, if they were interested in it. Um, and so those those actually ended up helping a lot. We had a lot of attendance at those. Um, and. Um, and then I'm looking, the other uh, thing that we have that's pretty big to our transitioning process is um, we are obviously a, so we're, this is our, we just finished our fourth year as a conference. Um, and um, we do have the resources of previous team members um, that we're utilizing. And so we have one of our alumni who was virtually a co-organizer to myself, uh, with myself, um, named Kayla. Um, and she is uh, in the District of Columbia still. And we also have a previous speaker from um, uh, two years ago now named uh, Dr. Lena Wen, who actually spoke at TED Med. Um, and she, both of those women, um, are sort of serving as advisors to our organization. And we're, our goal is to sort of continue that um, each year to sort of select and, um, you know, pick out who are the strong members that 
really played a role and would be willing and able to sort of help. And so this next year, Kayla will be meeting about once a month um, with our new co-curators just as a resource if they need it. Um, she'll be kept in a loop and she'll be there to say, you know, hey, um, I noticed you guys haven't mentioned this. Um, you might want to think about that um, just because of her experience. And she'll know things that they don't and vice versa. Um, and so we think that's important. And, um, and Lena as a speaker is important to us to keep in that loop just because what a great resource to have as somebody who said, hey, I loved when you treated me this way as a speaker and we got this. Um, is there a way that we can continue that um, uh, just in case that previous years forgot? And so it's sort of a way of keeping a, a family tree, if you will, of people that can be a resource. Um, and, uh, and then with that, of course, is just the actual natural transitioning of information. Uh, you know, I've transferred a ton of Google Docs, um, which I'm sure any TEDx person knows is um, you know, a savior. Um, and so I've transferred a ton of Google Docs to our, our team, and whether it's templates for partners or whether it's um, a starting template to reach out to speakers or whether it's actual email chains that I've had with, um, uh, with uh, speakers. And I've sort of been transitioning the information. And, and things that I think are important are you know, explaining that um, given all of these resources, uh, what, whoever you are, it's definitely a, you know, you got to provide your own sort of personality to it. You know, there's, I, you know, when it comes to inviting speakers, there's definitely a way to do it, but I would also say that every person sort of has their special, um, way. And so I think it was important for me and I think it would be maybe important for others to, as you transition on, not necessarily describe it as this is the way we do it. Um, the way that I said it was, this is the way that I did it. And, um, use it as you will, or, you know, change it. Um, and I think that's really important. It's, um, I don't think there's a right way to do any of this. Uh, I mean, with thousands of TEDx events, there's just, that's impossible. Um, I think there's, um, better ways and not so better ways, but I don't think there's a right and a wrong. And so, um, just, uh, um, in finishing up and I, uh, hope you all have questions if possible, but, um, the other thing that we kept in mind while doing this is, uh, given that we're all students, um, is a few things in the sense of um, with the co-curators, how do you keep uh, respect and authority over other team members that are also your age? Um, and I think that um, that could even be said in the case of just being in an adult world. I worked on a TEDx event before that was um, predominantly uh, middle-aged adults with full-time jobs organizing it. And even there, it's that idea of how do you, you know, how do you keep respect um, and even um, even how do you keep accountability with, uh, especially when it's volunteer and when people are older and younger or whatever. And so that was something that we really spent a lot of time thinking about. And um, one of the ways that we do that is we just be really honest with our team and our co-curators about um, saying things around the lines of, we don't know everything. And, um, you know, we are not your boss. Um, we are not in that light, but we hope that there's a mutual respect there that you can respect, um, you know, our decision making. Um, and more importantly, that, uh, you know, we can work together. And so I think at least having that conversation um, and not leaving it as an elephant in the room um, is important. Um, and then as well, um, the dynamic between the co-curators. I think when you do look at succession planning and trans transitioning, um, it's important to try and find um, the best person for the job or the best uh, people for the job. Um, you know, how well do they work together? Um, well, like in, in our case, I know we have... Um, such a left brain, right brain um, mixture of the two. We have the creative atmosphere in one of our, um, and the dreaming and the inspiration in one of our members and a massive worker as well. But then we have the uh, type A, uh, you know, very detailed, um, is that actually in the budget uh, type person um, on the other hand, and then they work really, really well together that way. And I think that that's huge uh, and important um, to keep in mind. And even then we, sort of require, and they'll, they'll do it, um, they've already done some um, themselves, but we try to require bonding um, between them. You know, we recommend that they get dinner and not talk about work. Um, we recommend that they, you know, actually be, you know, cohesive outside of the TEDx environment, just because um, I know, speaking personally, you can get so bogged down in that world. And I'm fortunate to love it so much that it doesn't do that very much, but, um, but it can be exhausting. And so you need to be able to have that relationship with your team and if you are doing sort of a co-curator transition um, between the two of them to actually mutually work. Um, and then also another last thing is just keeping transparency and respect. Um, for our co-curators, transparency is everything. And so for me, being able to say to them, this is how this works and this is where I screwed up 
um, and this is how we're going to learn from it was was huge. And and even with communicating with um, Ted um, as an organization, you know, with people like Amanda, people like the other people in the TEDx department, um, it was really important for me to not just say, oh, like you know, that's I can't show you, you know, this. I'm just I'm, I'm going to ask you know Ted HQ about it, and I'll let you know what they say. I was very open, and I would say, you know, this is who I'm communicating with, and you should join the TEDx hub. And I think that's a really big part of it, though, um, because people, we had 110 people apply to be part of our team this past year um, uh, for about 35 spots. And so it's very clear that people want to be involved in this organization. And if you make it exclusive, um, it can come off in a, in a way that I don't think you want to. Um, you know, finding the right people and the dedicated people, I think, is absolutely important. Um, and that's why we do applications and interviews and whatnot. But um, but if they're part of the team, then they should be part of the team. And so that's just sort of my side plug about really making sure people feel welcomed and respected. Um, I'm sure there's um, something I missed, but I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, and uh, I think, um, Amanda, I don't know if you have any um, curated questions for me or if I just should uh, open it up. No, I think it would be great if you just open it up so that people can kind of, like you were saying before, um, you were working a lot with students. So I'm sure that this is very much about who your team is, who the community is, what kind of environment it is. Um, Ian's kind of leaning forward, looking like he has a question. So I'm going to. Does Ian have a question? I don't currently. I'll think of, I'll think of one now. <laughs> okay. And just so you guys um, know, I, I have muted everyone, and, and, and so you can just feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. And even if you don't have a question, I can elaborate on something if it needs to be, um, or not. It's up to you. All right, so my question. Um, so would you say that there is ever an end to the transition period or like when when does that transition actually end for you? That's a great question. Um, I would say, uh, well, I think for me, um, I think the transition period will sort of linger um, for um, a bit um, just because I know that questions will arise and um, and whatnot. But I do think that at some point and pretty soon, actually, I, and I've, I've been feeling it recently. Um, I can keep answering questions and I can help and um, and give documents and resources out if I haven't already. But at some point I do think it's important to sort of, um, and so cliche and cheesy, but like let the birds fly from the nest and actually let them um, learn by uh, either succeeding or failing. Um, and I just think that's the best way to do it, um, in my opinion. And so um, for anyone transitioning, I do think that, you know, if you have a date of, you know, your position ending or if you graduate, um, I think that that is definitely a, a tangible date, but I do think that there will be some sort of lingering residual and um, continuation afterwards, but but nothing of, you know, you know, as if it was you were still part of the team, or at least there shouldn't be, just because if you're still, I think if you're still finding your, that you're spending hours and hours trying to do work, um, I think then you might not have successfully sort of passed along your duties, just because I feel, um, you know, if if I were to graduate and finish, but then continue working and helping and, you know, help planning next year's conference, that would be, I would sort of, that'd be me trying to hang on to something that I miss. Um, and, uh, and maybe who knows, maybe a year from now or two, I come back as a different type of resource, but I do think that there should be a clear sort of, I don't want to say cutting of the ties, but, um, you know, moving, moving on, if you will. Um, but in terms of an end, um, I think that's hard. And I think that that's, uh, I definitely don't have a, an actual, you know, this is when it ends answer. But, um, but I do think that um, the incoming leadership should respectfully, but, but um, confidently be able to say and, you know, move in a direction of thank you so much, you know, we'll take it from here. Um, just because uh, if, you know, and, and even if they don't have the confidence to sort of work towards that, um, just because I think there should be that sort of movement um, at some point following, you know, after the event or, you know, when the transition process is um, concluding, if you will. Anyone else have a question? 
So there is a question from somebody who's attending, so not participating in the chat, but um, Emmanuel had said that he won't do join the chat. So I'm going to just give him the link again to join because okay. I think he wanted to ask in person. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention really quickly um, for those of you on the chat, but also for the recording, um, Brian is still obviously going to be a really strong member of the TEDx community and you know the overall TEDx ecosystem. Um, and so that's something that I did want to make sure that from the from the TED perspective that people understand that even if you create a succession plan and follow through with it and sort of pass the torch, um, you're still obviously a, a member, a valued member of the community, and we want you to continue to check in with us and join us on the hub and, you know, offer advice and experience and insight um, to other incoming TEDx organizers um, so that we can continue to communicate with you and see how things are going and sort of what life is like after your your curation. Sure. Yeah, and actually, if I, if I could, um, I apologize for not saying that. I think that's hugely important. Um, just two examples of that is I know personally, um, in the next year while I travel, I'll be visiting TEDx events around the world um, and uh, and probably volunteering at many. And I know that my TEDx days are not over. If anything, they're just beginning. Um, and so when I return either to DC or New York or wherever I, might, I may be, um, that will inevitably, and I want that to continue. Um, additionally, um, I mentioned one of our alumni members who is helping us in a, as an advisor. Well, she also started her own TEDx youth event following her graduation and her you know, her ending time, if you will, at TEDx Foggy Bottom. And so she kind of rippled effect into that event. Um, and uh, one of our own team members actually went on to work at TEDHQ. Um, and so, um, uh, Brooke, and so she, um, we kind of, we've definitely, if it's kind of the opposite of ending when you transition on um, in, in a great way. And so just great point, Amanda. Um, yeah, the TEDx community will always be my tribe and my home. And if anything, I'm sort of just getting started settling in there. Did we figure out Emmanuel? Not yet. Um, so you know what? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just ask his question. Um, okay. Because you know, perhaps he's having a, a bit of trouble joining. Um, he really wanted to ask, how Brian, do you manage the relationship between the curator and the volunteers? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, so we uh, just to clarify, because sometimes, so just to clarify what how I would define volunteers and and myself, just because sometimes I know people call their team members volunteers. Um, so we have sort of the way we structure it is. Um, we have our, you know, our executive board slash leadership, which is this past year was myself with my six person executive board, all of us on the equal level. Um, and then we have our, we had our bulk team. So we had 35 team members along with the seven of us. And then um, aside from that, right around about maybe two months before the event actually happens, um, we have our two of our team members step up as volunteer coordinators and we have, um, and we have uh, two of them sort of reach out to find volunteers who will then be just lots of manual labor on the day of the event. And so just even more clarification, um, they help us on rehearsal day, they help us on the day of. Um, we honestly could not do the event without them. Um, we had, I think it was about 65 or so people um, actually submit their interest and hours to be involved this year as a volunteer. Um, so that's again, along with our 40 plus person team. Um, that being said, we tried to take those who were um, who were more available throughout the entire day. So, and we took about thirty. So that being said, um, when it comes to my relationship with them, um, uh, about the week the week of the event, we hold two sort of volunteer training meetings um, where we give them out their T-shirt and we explain to them, you know, sort of how the day is going to look. Um, this year, it was honestly fantastic because it was really it was really cool to see how much we progressed because I actually. I was not presenting. Um, I let the volunteer coordinators present. Um, however, I did just attend to say hello, um, which was really cool for me because I was just kind of this anonymous, you know, guy in the back, and um, and these volunteers were just these bright-eyed people who wanted to be involved. And so, <clears throat> the one thing I did end up saying um, at the very end is that many, many people have gone from being a volunteer to a team member, um, and then so forth. And that's like sort of the gateway into being involved with us, and we love that. And so. My direct relationship is that I attend those, um, and hopefully future co-curators will. 
um, but they don't, you know, um, commandeer the trainings and they don't, they don't make it their job. It's a, it's a delegated task. And I think that's hugely important for, for, uh, transitioning onward, because if you're doing everything, um, then, you know, no one's going to know how to do, um, a great amount. Um, and so, um, but that's sort of my relationship. And then on the day of, um, volunteers are pretty much treated with equal respect, uh, as a team member. And so I, um, you know, if they need something from me, they can ask and vice versa. Um, I personally am backstage all day, pretty busy. And so, um, they tend to ask others cause they see that I'm, um, in my zone, but, um, but they're, you know, they're just like students like you and me. Sometimes they're adults from the community. Um, and I guess to sum up, I think my relationship with them is great. Um, I love our volunteers each year. It's kind of like an exciting time because we get to see who randomly from the community wants to be a part of it. Um, I will say though that it's tough because we have people who want to be, we have people who, you know, eight months before the event asked to be a volunteer um, or to be even on the team, but we've already, or maybe we've just selected the team. And so it's a tough process for us because, um, you know, we want, we want, we love having people part of our community, um, but it's hard for us to give 40 people um, work to do. Um, it's hard to delegate that much. And we've even debated in the past, <clears throat> excuse me, if we find a, is there a way for us in the future, you know, a year from now, two years from now <clears throat> to involve people on like a very low commitment basis throughout the year. And, you know, we'll figure that out as <clears throat> we move forward, but that's sort of how my relationship is with them. Okay, I don't know if anybody else has another question. Emmanuel said thank you for, for he said, Brian has really answered my question. <laughs> um, so does anybody else have any more questions or Brian, did you want to comment on anything before we sort of wrap up? Um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, the one thing that I always say to my team <clears throat> is I just gratitude, I think is um i think the well let me put it this way the people have asked me sort of what my what is my like favorite part and or most successful part of being a curator slash being the leader of my team um <clears throat> and i think it's a two-part process with both gratitude and honesty um in the sense that i i literally could not put together anything without my team um and uh I pride myself on having a great environment within the team. We lead, we start every meeting with sort of these personal updates and we hear about everybody's lives outside of TED. Um, and so it causes a great cohesion between us. We did a, a huge sort of like ropes wilderness course at the beginning of the year together as a group, um, as like bonding. And we get dinners often. We do, you know, monument hikes in DC. Um, and with a clear point of getting to know each other past just colleagues. Um, again, that completely falls into a, it works well for my environment as a college student. So that might not work obviously best if you're a group of 50 uh, or 40 year olds, um, just trying to be honest, you know, it just depends on where you're organizing from. But for us, it works so well. And, but that's huge to me. I, seeing my team on the streets is like seeing um, a best friend. It's like seeing a family member. It's seeing somebody who I, really enjoy being around. And so that's really big for me to keep in mind um, throughout the year. We're not all business. Um, we don't, you know, people don't come into the meeting and think, oh God, you know, we're going to get yelled at again. Um, it's very, it's a very um, just uh, collaborative um, within our team. And, um, and then when it comes to the gratitude, um, I, you, you, you have to be uh, vulnerable and let yourself say thank you often. And, uh, um, and grow um, in order to be successful, in my opinion, as a as a team member, no matter who you are position wise, um, just because um, I think people deserve and and want to hear that their work is being noticed, um, and it is. And sometimes you can just get bogged down and forget to say it for you know a little bit, and that can you know people want to be people want to know that they're making an impact, and um, and they are. And so I think it's important to make sure that's known. And and when it comes time for the day of the event and um, they always do. And it's always fun to see one of our team members this year put it very well. She said, she said she loves seeing all the new team members because they're so excited 
but they have no idea what they're excited for. Um, and I really like that line because it's true. If you've never done a TEDx event before, you're you're so excited, but you have no idea what it's going to look like. And then when the day actually happens, it's um, it has ended up being many, if not all of our team members' favorite day of the entire year. Um, and it really is for me. And so um, it's, uh, it's just important that you really keep people energized. And one way of doing that is not necessarily bringing candy to every meeting, but it's just giving them the the uh, the praise and the comfort that they deserve. Um, and so that's just a huge thing that's important to me as um, a, a team member and as a curator um, in my position. So, but yeah, that's that's all I have to say. Uh, well, thank you very much, Brian. Um, okay. And you. Brian is going to be. Um, we're going to upload the archive edited without my faux pas at the beginning um, and put it on the TEDx Hub. We are going to upload um, a really, really, really comprehensive, um, super amazing one sheeter that Brian put together. And I believe you have some sort of manifesto that you are working on that maybe you can share with us at some point. Um, I yep. think that the reason I really wanted Brian to do this Hangout is because he has put so much thought and effort um, and love into thinking about what's going to happen to his TEDx team and community after he leaves, quote unquote. Um, and I think it's a really great conversation to start having, even if you're not thinking quite yet that you're ready to uh, give up, you know, the golden throne. <laughs> Um, it's a really good idea to just put some systems in place and start thinking about archiving and writing everything down, writing down your process. Um, it's just really important. Um, and thank you, Brian. That was wonderful. And um, I'm super excited to see what kind of conversations and questions come out of this. Um, so we'll be sure to kind of make sure that everyone knows that you are the one who wrote all of this and can best answer questions about it. Um, and I think we should conclude this, um, this Hangout series for today. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, you guys. Bye.